Hey, it's Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And we're back to the top 100 again. Hope you enjoyed your weekend. I am alone this time. There's no uh, crazy Devon person next to me. We'll see if we can get more special guests for the rest of the series. I don't know if we will or won't. I don't actually have any plans yet. But either way, let's go ahead and dive on into it. And this is the top 100. There are have already been three videos in this series. This is the fourth. There will be six more after this as we go through the top 100 games of all time, as of 2021. A few quick notes that I've done in previous videos, timestamps for everything down below, but effectively, first of all, my ranking system, my methodology over here is I use PubMeeple, which I'll link to, it's a highly recommend if you want to rank your own games, but PubMeeple allows you to put your own list of games into there and rank your games, and basically it gives you choices. Do you want to play this or that, this or that? And after enough questions, it ranks it for you. It forces you to consider direct binary uh, questions as opposed to a full list, which is a lot easier to absorb. That said, the way I do it in order to not have to ask a million questions, because it can take a long time with a lot of games, is I first bucket my games into categories of fives, fours, three, two, one, etc., and then I put each bucket into PubMeeple to spit out a ranking from there. And then when I'm done with that, I go ahead and manually override it, because because I get to say what I like more, not pub meeple. Uh, past that, a few general notes is games I don't own are not going to make this list, even if I love them, which will introduce some interesting questions, which we'll get to in this video. So uh, towards the end, we'll talk about some interesting questions about stuff like that. But anyways, let's go ahead and dive on into it. For this list, for these 10 games, three of these games are new to me. One is new new to like me entirely. Uh, one of them is new to this list, a game I own but has not been on my top 100 in the past. And then three of these are Kickstarter games. And we're going to start off the bat with Critters at War. Critters at War, more specifically, Air, Land, and Sea. It's the Air, Land, and Sea. Critters at War is just the... Uh, prettier looking game. I mean, it's got cartoon artwork. I like that. Uh, this, this to me is the difference between uh, Century Spice Road and Century Galm Edition. The same exact game mechanics, but this is a prettier game. I've covered this in the past. I've reviewed it. I recently put it in a video of a top five head-to-head, -head, top five two-player head-to-head games, or whatever it's called. But Critters at War is a game that the thing I love about this game, it's a lane battle. You're going to have three lanes, air, land, and sea, as you might imagine, as players play cards on their side to try to win their battle. You're going to be drawing from 18 cards. That's all there are. There are 18 cards. You're going to start with six cards in your hand, potentially drawing one more. So you get to a little bit of a mind play as you're like, I have six. I know the other 12 because you will learn them across multiple plays. And then you try to think through what other players are doing. To me, what makes this game so much fun is twofold. First of all, just the 18 cards leads you to kind of playing out around in your head. You sit there and you look at your cards. You're like, you might have that. I have this. Okay, let's go ahead and start trying to play this out to take advantage of the sequencing of the cards and the way they could come out. But from there, the catch to, to this game, the catch, is the fact that you can withdraw at any point. And if you withdraw, you lose. You do lose. But your opponent gets less victory points. Which means it's a constant bluff of, do you think you have this? And at what point are you going to back down because it's clear that you don't? You do want to back down if you're not going to win because otherwise, two wins and your opponent wins. But if you back down, if you, if you strategically redraw, if you regroup, then you have an opportunity to go through multiple games, maybe four, maybe even five games before you lose, which gives you a lot more opportunity to win. It's such an excellent game. This one was is actually new to me, by the way. Not new to me, new to this list. If you're counting Airland and Sea, not Critters at War specifically, I didn't put this on my top 100 last year. I have to imagine that was an oversight because I've loved this game from since I first played it. That's not entirely true. I've loved this game from my third play of it. It took a, two, a play or two for me to really, to really grok, to really understand the brilliance of this game. Game. But I can't imagine why this was not in my top 100 last year. I'm going to call it an oversight and move on. This is number 70 for me. Let's put it over here because why not? From there we have number 69. Number 69 is a game that has been on my list in the past. This is Sheriff of Nottingham, which I recently upgraded with like fun metal coins and everything because I like this game and I want upgrades for it. Anyway, Sheriff of Nottingham, this is an incredible game from, from uh, Dice Tower Essentials game. Not the only Dice Tower Essentials game on my top 100. Dice Tower Essential, apparently some of the games are actually pretty good, which is not really that much of a surprise. I'm getting distracted. Honestly, this should be a Dice Tower. This is this is Arcane. This is Arcane Wonders. This should be a Dice Tower Essential. I don't know why this is not. I'm getting sidetracked. Anyways, Sheriff of Nottingham is a fantastic game. You can go ahead and watch Will Wheaton Tabletop. Miss that show? I miss that show. It was so good. Will Wheaton has a great tabletop episode of, of this. What happened there? Uh, Will Wheaton has a great uh, tabletop episode of Sheriff of Nottingham which really captures the dynamic of this game. You see in the game, you're basically trying to smuggle goods past the sheriff. You're going to have rounds of play where players take turns being the sheriff. And then when they're the sheriff, you're like, hey, sheriff, I got some goods over here. And you walk right up to them and you tell them what you have. You look at them in the eye. You tell them with a straight face. And then you choose whether to bribe them or not. And this is where the mind games begin and they never stop again. Because sometimes you're telling the truth. 
but you'll still try to bribe them because as soon as you start bribing them, then they start wondering, well, if you're bribing me, you must be hiding something. How much are you hiding? How much can I push you? And you go back and forth, you wiggle a bit. I'll give you four canes, no five canes, no six coins, no four. No, I'm sticking hard at five. I guarantee you this is the most you'll make off me. If you open the bag, Sheriff, you will regret it. And then they open it. Maybe you're telling the truth, maybe you'll not. You'll never really know until you play the game, but it gives you that feeling, that, that feeling of, of messing with the other person. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but it all comes down to trying to outsmart the sheriff as you wander into Nottingham with your goods. Ignore the box that just fell. That was that was oddly positioned. It's not like timestamps would hide this anyway. Anyways, that is Sheriff Nottingham. It is an amazing bluffing game, an amazing experience that really just has players just trying to screw with each other, and it's so much fun. Sometimes you have these, I remember one time one of my friends tried to bribe me with 20 coins, and I was so sure that he was lying, and he had the edge at that game, and I knew that I had to open his bag, I had to open it, and I opened it, and he was telling the truth. I lost my $20 bribe, and he sauntered in, and he won the game. I say it like friends, I mean ex-friend, that's what I mean. Sheriff of Nottingham is brilliant, I love the experience. Come on, I actually put out a new version of the game. From looking at it, I, I haven't had it, from looking at it, I, I think I like the original better, and seems that's the general consensus, because people seem to want this one, but either way, I like this game. I am a huge fan of Sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, last year, this was 77, so it's actually gone up say, eight spots since last year, which, I mean, I've played it once or twice. I don't know, necessarily know why it's gone up, past my appreciation for it. Then again, 77 to 69, at this part, it's still, you know, there's still room for just general whims of where I am at any given point. And with that, let's put Sheriff of Nottingham off to the side and continue to number 68. Number 68, which is... Kind of a complicated one to go into, so let's go ahead and go into it, because that's what we do here, which is Resident Evil 3 by Steamforge Games. And this one, next year, this is how, I, I almost guarantee this, almost, not actually guarantee, because that would be uh, foolish, but I almost guarantee, although it actually depends on timeline. So let's, let's give some context. Resident Evil 3 is a game that I do not think will be on my top 100 next year, although it might, we'll see. On the other hand, I think Resident Evil will. You see, Resident Evil which is from Steamforge Games as well, is the newest version of Resident Evil 3. They had Resident Evil 2, then 3, then Resident Evil. The timeline is confusing, let's ignore that for a second. But the point is that I prefer Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3, although I have played and very much do enjoy Resident Evil 3. This is not merely a placeholder, this genuinely is where it is. Versus if I were if I were including Resident Evil on this list, which I'm not because it's not yet available. It's a Kickstarter game. I do not include anything on this list that is still a prototype or development. It has to be available, something that multiple people, tons of people have in their hands, on the shelves or whatever before I include it. And so assuming that Resident Evil comes out on time or this or that, then the Resident Evil will likely be my top 100 and I imagine it will be higher up on this list. And Resident Evil 3 will likely not be because I don't feel the need to have duplicates, kind of duplicates. Resident Evil for context, uh, both these games, I'm going to talk about Resident Evil 3 specifically. Resident Evil 3 is a game in which you have the, the characters from Raccoon City, from the whole lore of Resident Evil. You're wandering around trying to take out zombies. The, game, the place where this game stands out is the fact that every single zombie is a threat. I talked about this briefly when talking about Nemesis. When I was talking about Nemesis, and Nemesis was my 98, 97, or something like that. Nemesis is a game that I really enjoy, but the tension of trying to stay alive with every alien being a threat is the key part for me, and Resident Evil 3 gives me that. And it gives me that so far without mixed gameplay experiences, which I've had mixed gameplay experiences with Nemesis so far. So Resident Evil 3, though, it gives you that sense of every single zombie being a threat. You have limited ammo, as you do in Nemesis. Every single character is a threat, as they are in Nemesis. You're ultimately trying to survive, as you are in Nemesis. And that's kind of where the, the, the thing breaks down. Things start diverging very quickly from there. But Resident Evil 3 gives you that sense of exploration. It gives you that sense of everything being a threat. It gives you that sense of survival. It does have campaign play, which is a bit of a strike against it. Uh, to me, personally, I don't dive into campaigns as much as I would like. But it actually has campaign play in a way which isn't really kind of campaign play. Think of Zombicide, think of going through a Zombicide experience, where if you were going through Zombicide, Zombicide in a series of progression, then that's kind of what this feels like. It doesn't feel like a campaign where I have to sit down and play the next game and then finish the campaign. It feels like a campaign where I can play a game today, play a game in three weeks, play a game in two months, and I'll still be able to enjoy and appreciate it without being bogged down by all the things you have to remember. It's fairly linear in terms of what it's trying to do, but it works fairly well. I love the sense of every single character being a threat. I love the activation system in terms of the way the zombies move. And this is where another area where to first Nemesis. To me, the challenge and puzzle of opening and closing doors to ensure zombies do or don't activate as you go through this puzzle, really, really solid. 
There are reasons why I believe Resident Evil, not Resident Evil 3, will overtake this on this list, but I won't get in into those today. I'll wait until it actually does happen, but they made some changes to the game, and I like Resident Evil more than Resident Evil 3, but Resident Evil is not yet available. That's my number 68, which is new to, the, new to me entirely, by the way. I have not played this until this past year. This is new to me for this 2021 Top 100 of all time, which brings us to number 67. Number 67, which is a box full of cards, and this is Valeria Card Kingdoms. With art by the Micho from Daily Magic Games, Valeria Card Kingdoms to date is my favorite Valeria game. I, I, I kind of rank it or rate it the same as I rate it, not rank it. I rate it, no. I rank, I score it, I score it, let's use that terminology. I score this one the same as I do Margaris of Valeria, and yet Margaris of Valeria left my collection because of the types of games they're trying to be. Margaris of Valeria is trying to be a slightly heavier game that is competing in a realm of games that I like more, and so Margaris eventually left, despite me really enjoying it and recommending it, and I give it a 4 to 5. Daily, uh, Valeria Card Kingdoms, on the other hand, is to me my favorite of the Valeria universe because of the pure, simple gameplay it brings. I enjoy sitting down and playing this with heavy gamers, I enjoy sitting down and playing this with my family, I enjoy sitting down and playing this with anyone. Ultimately, this is a game that falls into the Machiko, the Catan, the space-based universe of games where you roll dice and get stuff for it. On your turn, you roll dice, I get stuff. On my turn, I roll dice. I still get stuff. We all get stuff when we roll dice. It gives you that little, like, that little feeling of just those neurons firing as you, I get a this, and I get a that, I get a magic, and I get a fight, and I get a gold, and I get all these things. And when my turn comes around, I have to spend those. So I'm going to go ahead and recruit another another citizen, because more citizens means more stuff. I'll go ahead and fight a baddie, or I'll, I'll conquer a domain. There's all these things you can do, and if you expand it as well. I have all the expansions for this, at least all the expansions to date. They have Dark Sworn, which just hasn't yet arrived. It gives you more stuff to do. It adds complexity to the game, so I do recommend diving in with the base game first before you start adding expansions, especially the C ones, or whatever it's called, the something of Valeria. It has Cs, it has a whole new island, it has a fun new action system you can do. I really do enjoy it, but I don't recommend it as a good starting point. To me, and I know Space Base is well-loved, and Amachi Core I think is a little less well-loved, I think Space Base is very well-loved as far as these systems go. And there's a new one too that I, I've just heard about but haven't had the opportunity to play that I can't remember the name. But to me, Valeria Card Kingdoms is the best of this universe of simply rolling dice and taking stuff. It is fun, it is accessible, it expands fairly nicely, it gives you a lot of content. I really enjoy Valeria Card Kingdoms coming in at 67. Now, now, this has dropped since last year. It was 49 last year. It has dropped primarily because it's been played very infrequently this past year. Something I didn't touch upon this video, although I have in other videos, is I am a hugely affected by recency bias. If I've played something more recently, then it is likely to garner more attention in terms of remembering how much I like that game and why it's in my collection. And to address somebody's comments, somebody said, does that mean this is really the top 100 of games you've played this year? The answer is no. There are a handful, not very many, there are a handful of games in my top 100 that I have not played at all this year. But they are a handful. Ideally, games that I love enough to call my top 100 are getting tabled. Sometimes they don't. They can still stay here if I believe and know that they still will get tabled. But either way, Valeria Card Kingdoms dropping from 49, small drop, to 67. That is my 67. Which brings us to 66. 66, which is Istanbul. Istanbul is a game that I actually got rid of at one point and then got back. I have everything for this game. I have upgrade. I have like inserts, all these things for Istanbul. Istanbul is a solid game from Rüdiger Dorn and AEG. This is, well, after I just sat there and dished Space Space. I didn't dish Space Space. I just prefer Valeria Card Kingdoms. But Istanbul ranks higher than Valeria, so I guess technically that's a win for AEG. Istanbul is a game that I got rid of at one point because I found the base game of Istanbul to not be rewarding enough to keep from me personally. I think it's solid, I think it's accessible, I think it's a good game. Effectively, Istanbul has this puzzle of you're moving your merchant around the board, but the problem is you have a stack of assistants, and as you move, you drop off your assistants where you go, and the problem is you can only move, you can only activate if you drop off an assistant or pick up an assistant, which means as you move around the board, activating different locations, locations that will be varied every single game you play, you're going through this puzzle of trying to figure out, I have to eventually start backtracking my steps because I have to pick up assistance in order to continue the activation. Think of yourself as a, as a bit of a slinky, expanding a bit, but having to contract if you want to keep functioning. Expand a little more, contract, expand, trying to ricochet around the board in ways that actually give you the puzzle that you need as you figure out, I need to go to this location, I'll trade on those goods, I'll get the ruby over there because ultimately you're trying to get six rubies as you play through Istanbul and the puzzle gives you a little bit of an engine to go through. And this all sounds wonderful, and it was, but the base game for me didn't feel like it was varied enough in the kind of engine it was building. The core gameplay, the, the seeing the pattern amongst the, the, the locations and amongst how you have to activate, that was there for sure, absolutely. And there are these temples you can go to that give you these little powers. I love powers. Awesome. Excellent. I liked the base game. 
But for me, the expansion, Mocha and Bakshi specifically, I still haven't played with Letters and Seals, it is in this box, have not played with it. Mocha and Bakshi is where I went from Istanbul is a good game that I enjoy to Istanbul is a great game with nuance, with variance, with, str with different strategies you can pursue, different options. Now you can suddenly slide across the entire board, now you can start planting walls that only you can go through. Now there are, there are more pathways to victories. It's not just about goods or money, it's all about these other things too. There's temples, there's coffee shops, there's, 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 there's money, there's goods, there's everything you can possibly do. You can expand and fill your wagon, there's so many opportunities. And the board is larger too, which gives you even more of a puzzle. I'm excited to add letters and seals. I haven't done so yet, but I love Istanbul. But I, I liked Istanbul. I love Istanbul with Mocha and Bakshish. This is coming in at 66, still dropping, dropping from 46 last year. So this did see a bit of a drop, not a major one. Again, it has been played a decent amount actually this past year. I just think other games are rising up. So I guess maybe that's true for Valeria as well. I don't really know. I don't I don't have firm answers as to why things drop. Ultimately, I just rank my games, and I call it what it is, and I go from there. Which brings us to 65. 65, which is... Oh, sorry for this. This is the That's the lowest I have to reach for any of these games. Tribune. Tribune is a phenomenal game, and it's one that doesn't see the love that I would love it to see, if that makes sense. Tribune is a worker placement game from Fantasy Flight. This has been out of print for a long time. They actually recently came out with a newer version of Tribune. I have no interest in that one. The art and the board, everything just does not look like a game that I'm interested in. They added some gameplay stuff. It's, there's all these relaunches. Sometimes they're like amazing, and I want the relaunch thing. Other times, older is better. We're seeing that with Sheriff of Nottingham 2 over here, where sometimes the older version of a game is just desired more. Lots of times why I prefer the old version, and lots of times why I for the new version. Remember the day when they released the new Pandemic and we sat there thinking, oh my gosh, that board looks horrible. And slowly over time, the original Pandemic has faded from our collective memories, sort of adjacent-ish. So sometimes, sometimes you can't stop change, but at least for today, I can stop the change of Tribune. Tribune is work replacement, but it's work replacement along with trying to outthink your opponent, outwit your opponent, to, to go where they are going, to take their factions from them, because as you go around the board, you're effectively collecting cards, cards that will be utilized so you can take control of different factions in the game. Because you're doing this all to get various victory conditions. Every single game has different cards in play that will define the victory conditions, the things you need to go for, whether it's coins, whether it's points, whether it's a scroll, different options on the table. So every game is slightly different in terms of the pathways you are pursuing. But what you're always doing every single game is you're pursuing the different factions, control and take over the factions will reward you with different things, but us will control the factions every single round, but then you can also bid for various locations on the spot to get more cards, you can also take the various faction takeover benefits, you can also bid for control of the chariot so that other players cannot take over factions from you. I realize I'm talking pretty fast today, but that's, uh, that's okay, it's just, it's all the coffee. But yeah, Tribune is, Tribune is really solid. I love the worker placement, I love the, 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 the actions you're taking as you try to figure out how to best manipulate and outpace your opponent from the start to the end of the victory line, because make no mistake, ultimately Tribune is a race. It's a race to the different victory conditions and the pathways you will take, and trying to get there and take over the right factions at the right time, to have control at the right factions of the right time, at the of the right factions at the right time, I swap those words there. There's a lot going on in Tribune, and it's so ridiculously rewarding. Really enjoy Tribune. It is my number 65. 65, and this is one that actually went up a bit since last year. It was 69 last year. Played it a few times. I mean, I don't know. Again, I don't have a firm answer. This one, just I just like it. I like Tribune a lot. It continues to stay solidly in my collection year after year. It's been like five, six years. I don't. It's been a while since I had Tribune. This has lasted for a while. Most of my top 100, despite all the new-to-me ones... I mean, there's probably, after the, I'll do the numbers at the end, I guess, but there's probably like 25% of the top 100, maybe 20% are new to me games. There's a lot of stuff that's the cult of the new, I play something new, I enjoy it, I appreciate it, and it sticks around. And then some of those are my top 100 last year, they're still here now, because that makes sense, I like these games. But a lot of my top 100 are older favorites that have stuck around for a long time, there's a reason they are here, there's a reason they've stuck around, which brings me to 64, my number 64, which is the box that fell earlier, the biggest box, which is why it's over here, this is Lancaster. Lancaster, the big box, which I've played one of the expansions, I think. I should probably put this in the bottom of the stack. That makes more sense, right? Lancaster from Queen Games, the original big boxes back before big boxes were cool. Hear that, Queen Games? Back before big boxes were cool. Big boxes used to not be cool. When you did a big box, when you did Carcassonne, when you did Lancaster, it meant something. When you did Alhambra, it meant something. Now every single game has to be another big box. I'm not really complaining. I mean, I look at Kickstarter. They're all big boxes. I just unboxed Horizon Zero Dawn. That is a nightmare. That makes this thing look reasonable. But nonetheless, Lancaster is an older classic. I want to say Matthias Kramer. Matthias Kramer, I know my designers. Although I probably can't pronounce them, my designers' names, but I do know who they are. Lancaster is a such a, such a good game. It is a game of, again, worker placement. And how many worker placements do we have here? Not actually that many, never mind. Lancaster is a game of worker placement. It's a game, actually there's more. There's another worker placement coming. Hey, fun. Okay, so worker placement 
It's a game where you have your knights. You start off with your two knights, you place them on the board, and you only have four rounds and two knights, and you're trying to sit there and think through, how am I possibly going to take actions in this game if there's two knights, two characters that I can place out, and there's only four rounds, that's eight placements, and yet as you start going around the board, you're going to be upgrading your knights, and you're going to be adding more knights to your board. And every single location has a strength. You're basically trying to knock people out of the locations, because as you knock them out, you get control of the location. So upgrading is as impactful as getting more stuff. And yet somehow by the time four rounds are done, you've gotten so much done, it feels like you really got everything everything you wanted done, it's not everything you wanted, that would leave you not craving another game, it leaves you just feeling like you got enough done that the gameplay of Lancaster is so ridiculously rewarding. There's a lot of locations to go through, there's a bunch of expansion content I haven't felt the need to dive into because every time I pull this one out, I'm happy to play just the base game, I own the big box because I'm that kind of crazy, but I, I'm happy to play just the base game of Lancaster time and time again. And then there are these laws you're voting on, these laws that you're voting on which laws will pass, which laws will favor you, and you don't want to be on the edge of a cliff by yourself because other players will push you off. You specifically want to be focusing on things that other players are going for. This round I'll focus on that because I know that when we vote on the laws, you probably are aligned with me. If you try to sit there and say, I'll do my own thing, you'll lose every single vote. So you have to work a little bit with other players. It's not semi-co-op, not by a long shot. It's doing your own thing, but understanding that you can't be... A something unto yourself. A, a There's got to be an expression there. You can't be a, a wolf unto itself. A, you can't be a lone wolf. Let's go with that. You can't be a lone wolf. You have to work with others in this game. But you work with others very minimally. The rest of it is all about the placement, all about the screwage of knocking out your pieces, of trying to tactfully place your piece, knowing full well you'll be knocked out and you're okay with that because then you get to see a little bit more as the board unfolds, as the other players show their hand. So sometimes you're placing because you want a spot, sometimes you're placing because you want to be knocked out. And it's always fun to mess with other players' expectations, either by knocking them out where they didn't want to be knocked out or leaving them still where they did want to be knocked out. You mess with them, you screw with others as they screw with you, you vote in the laws that favor yourself. It is an amazing experience, one that has been around for quite some time. This is 64 for me, dropping very marginally from 60 last year. A very subtle shift. It's still being played. It's still a game I enjoy very much. Lancaster at number 64, which brings me to number 63, which is another new-to-me game. This one is Maglev Metro from Bezier Games. Maglev Metro is delightful. I still owe a review of this one. I have to get like a review. Actually, I, I, I want to play it more. I want to go into it more, but I've played it enough that I'm willing to put it in my top 100. It's a game... It's a game of, of pick up and deliver, which by the way is a testament unto itself, the fact that it's in my top 100 as a pick up and deliver game because I don't typically enjoy pick up and deliver games, although if you've played Maglev Metro you know that I do like it because it also has powers and abilities. You see the things you pick up and deliver are basically more customers, more, more, more passengers that will then be slotted into your board to unlock powers and abilities. So it's not like you're picking up a random good that you then sell for too many, you're picking up your next power and ability that you'll be able to use to upgrade your engine, to upgrade your freight line as you try to figure out which abilities will most suit you in this game, which abilities will lead you to actually being able to do what you want more efficiently and faster than other players. You're going to zip around the board, you're going to be upgrading the speed of your train, you're going to be upgrading your ability to swap cubes around, to swap other, to basically make your train modular, to make your pathways modular, to be able to reverse on a track, because one of the tricky parts of Maglev Metro is if there's a track, you have to keep moving along the edge of the track until you get to the end of the line, unless of course you got the ability that lets you not do that. Everything's about those abilities, everything's about trying to get more passengers onto the table, trying to upgrade which passengers you can carry trying to do so faster and more efficiently than other players. There are multiple maps in the game. There are there's expansion maps coming out soon, I believe. I don't know exactly when. Maglev Metro is incredibly solid at what it's doing. When I first heard about this game, I thought that the that the shtick of the game was the overlaid acrylic tiles. Because you have these tiles where you can place out tiles similar to you with the way you would in Steam and Age of Steam and Railroads of the World. But the difference is, this, these ones are, are acrylic, they overlay, they're plastic, you can see all the other pathways beneath it. I thought that was what, ma what made Maglev Metro special, but it's not. It's the fact that every passenger you pick up is another step towards improving your abilities, to improving how strong you are. And I love that about the game, I love that, that upgrading system. It's new to me, I have not played this one, I haven't played it before 2021, but it's my number 63, a really solid experience that I'm eager to continue to dive back into. Which brings me to my number 62, the last new to me on this list, and my number 62, Honestly, should have been a clue because I forgot to uh, replace the box behind me, I'm realizing now. I usually I slide a box down so it's not as obvious. But it's the Great Wall, which usually would be in this cubby right over here, kind of, right there. The Great Wall from Awakened Realms is my number 62. This is another new-to-me one, and it's so ridiculously good. Honestly, it would be higher on this list if it wasn't a little on the hard side to table. Between the amount of content you have, between taking everything out of the box, between choosing which expansions to set up and mix in, it's, it's a little hard to table. Not ridiculously so. It's still an amazing game. 
The Great Wall is the last worker placement one on this particular set of 10 games. So we have three worker placements. We have, a, what is it, a, um, Tribune, we have Lancaster, and we have the Great Wall, all giving you a worker placement experience. And the Great Wall is worker placement as you try to build out. You can play it cooperatively, you can play it competitively, both options are available. You can play it solo. I When I play it solo, I play it cooperatively two-handed, because the solo involves uh, autonomous players, and I'm not a fan of autonomous players. It's a game, though, that I think I enjoy it more cooperatively to the point that I, as much as I do enjoy it as a solo experience, I think I would primarily play it as a competitive experience. All that said, The Great Wall is a game about building out your wall. But more importantly, as you may have noticed with things that I like and don't like, it's a game where it's all about the powers and abilities. Specifically, the thing that makes The Great Wall special for me, the thing that takes it from being a good game to a great game, is the core mechanics are a good game. I actually had a lot of doubts about this one. I thought this game, when I backed this one, I backed it with the understanding that an Awakened Realms game almost always holds its value. But I was 100% prepared, 100 prepared to sell it as soon as I got it and found it wasn't for me, but man, this game is good. You see, The Great Wall... The good game is just the fact that the core mechanics and engine are present. It gives you a good experience. The great game part are the generals and the advisors. You see, every player has a general, but as you upgrade your general, what you're effectively doing is you slot advisors. You're trying to gather advisors in the game, and advisors will either give you more abilities, more ways to build out your tableau, or as you slot them underneath your general, you're making your general more powerful. So you have this constant trade-off of, do I make my general more powerful? Do I make their ability better than it was before? Or do I take this advisor because this ability complements my general really well, or complements my advisors really well, or just complements the current board state that is best suited to me? I'm focusing heavily on gold production, this advisor is going to reward me for doing so, how do I want to do it? And there's so much expansion content here, there's tons of advisors, there's tons of ways to mix up the abilities. But past that, the core engine of the game is you're placing down your various workers, your, your clerics or whatever they're called, they're called something else, I can't remember what they're called, maybe they're called clerics, I don't remember what they're called. You're placing down your, your, your workers on the various spots on the board to take actions. Part of the tricky part of the game is some actions only trigger once a variable number of players have gone there. So you kind of sometimes go on a spot hoping that other players will join you. Let's let's go collect wood together. You'll help me because you want wood and I want wood and we'll both get wood together. But that could result in you being screwed and sometimes you will be screwed across the course of the game. You it will certainly be times where you don't get what you want because other players don't help you, especially if you're winning. If you're winning, players are even less incentivized to help you. They are far more incentivized to leave you stranded on your own. The good news is there are actions and cards you can take and play that will help you, that will reward you, that will let you close off an action that other players weren't letting you close off. So there are mitigating factors, just don't rely on them too often, you won't be able to. But past that, you're going to be upgrading your units, you're going to be gathering more units, you're going to be sending them to the wall, you're going to be trying to battle the hordes. My main critique is the... The hordes feel less than inspiring. They feel abstracted to the nth degree. I mean, they are. It's a worker placement Euro game. It's not a heavy Ameritrash game. But So the, the hordes are very abstracted. I don't really love that about the game. And the card mechanic of the cards you play every single round to drive the action, it, I, I don't love how they feel very one-time use in the nature. I, again, there are aspects of the game that I can complain about. But primarily, at the end of the day, the general and advisor system draws this game from being a good game to being a great game, a game that I want to dive into every single time, because the tableau you build, the powers and abilities you build out every single game will be vastly different, especially if you have expansion content, then vastly, vastly different, because there's so many different ways you can augment this game. I haven't even played with it all yet. I've played with the base game, i played with the sieges and towers, uh, with the black something, it's called the black powder expansion. i played with some other modules, but not yet everything. There's a lot going on in this game. That's The Great Wall, new to me, number 62. Which brings me to 61, which is an interesting conversation about the nature of games that, well, let's just go into it. 61 is Pandemic Legacy. Now, this particular copy over here is in shrink to boot, and you're like, well, how can you have a game that's in shrink on your list? And the answer is complicated. The answer is very complicated. First of all, we may as well de-shrink it while we're here. Let's have a conversation about the nature of new games or not. So, Pandemic Legacy, this is Pandemic Legacy Season 0, which, as evidenced by the shrink part, I have not played the game. But I have played Pandemic Legacy Season 1. And I've played Pandemic Legacy Season 2. In fact, I've played Pandemic Legacy Season 1 and 2 both twice. Do you know how many games of Pandemic that is? That's roughly 80 to 90 games of Pandemic right there, okay? Just, just, those, just those four games right alone. And I don't think that I'll be playing Pandemic Legacy... Sorry for the plastic noise. I don't think that I'll be playing Pandemic Legacy Season 1 again or Season 2 again. I may well play Season 0 twice. I imagine I probably will. There's a decent chance that that will happen because, I mean, at least once. It's going to happen at least once. So, Pandemic Legacy is one of those interesting potential exceptions to ranking games in my top 100. I said at the beginning of this video that I am not interested in including games that I don't own. If I don't own you as a game, how can I call you part of my top 100, even if I think you're a great game, even if I were to recommend you very easily to you? It might be something that I think is better suited for your top 100, but for me it's gone, it's moved on. Pandemic Legacy is an interesting conversation around that conversation because of the fact that 
I haven't played Season Zero, but I'm willing to include this as part of the series as long as I as long as they continue making Pandemic Legacies, as long as I continue to own them and dive back into them, I will include them if they're supposed to be here. Right now, this is kind of in a limbo state. This hasn't been played. The other four are gone because I'm not. I mean, the other two played twice are gone. So it's an interesting uh, dilemma. And I'll have this with other games as well. Sometimes I'll get rid of great games because they're just not hitting the table. Even if I think it's an amazing experience, if I'm not playing it and if I deprioritize it to the point that it leaves my collection, it's not going to be in my top 100 no matter how good it might be. But then I'm going to see is weirder than that because it's not that I don't want to dive into it. It's that I did dive into it and now I'm done with it. And I, I think, I could be wrong, I think they said Pandemic Legacy Season Zero was their last foray into the system. I don't know why they'd say that. I mean, they've said it about Dominion, and they lied, so even if they said it, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. But I am curious whether they will make more Pandemics. I'm curious whether they'll make more Pandemic Legacies. You see, Pandemic Legacy ruined Pandemic for me. I love Pandemic. I had all the expansions for it, but Pandemic Legacy was better than Pandemic. It made me no longer appreciate the experience of Pandemic because I'd rather just play Pandemic Legacy. Now, other cooperative games, still in my collection, absolutely. It didn't ruin cooperative games for me, but it certainly gave me a a hint, a taste of legacy games in general, to the point that I will play subpar games because they have legacy attached to it, and legacy, I think, elevates the game. I think that sense of progression, that sense of unlocking, that sense of discovery, I think those can elevate a game to here to here, which means if it's a bad game, it could be a good game. If it's a good game, it could become a great game, and if it's a great game, it can become an absolutely amazing game. I understand exactly why Pandemic Legacy was at one point the, the number one rated game on Board Game Geek before Gloomhaven, arguably another legacy-ish game, overtook it. Sense of progression and, and discovery gives you a reason to dive into things, gives you an incentive to continue to explore something that otherwise would slowly become stale over time. I love Pandemic Legacy, the general system of it. This is number 61 for me. It was 32 last year. But again, it's a little tricky just because where does it lie at any given point? Have I played it? Have I not? Am I done with it? Am I not? I don't know exactly where that lies. Like I said already, as long as I have it in my house, I am willing to consider it as part of my top 100. So maybe I'll get Season Zero back another time. When I actually, I haven't actually played it yet. I don't know when I'll play it. But when eventually I do sit down and play this, we have plans. We have plans to play a lot of games, and things have to be chosen at any given point. But when eventually I do play through it and it leaves, maybe I'll get it back again. Maybe it'll come up with Season 4. I'd love to see it. Please, Z-Man Games, by all means, put out Season 4. I'd love to dive in. I'd love to experience it. There's no... You keep putting these things out, I will keep buying them and playing it because I love... The core system of Pandemic is already a reliable system of... I didn't really talk about the game at all, by the way. I apologize for that. I got distracted by this whole conversation about the nature of it. Pandemic as a system is basically a cooperative experience in which you are trying to stop disease cubes from taking over the world. It might become a little too real now with COVID and everything going on. At one point, this is a purely abstract system that was just a theoretical concept. Oh, let's stop a pandemic. That sounds fun. Now it's like, let's stop a pandemic, please. I beg you, please. Let's really stop a pandemic. But either way, Pandemic Legacy... Pandemic as a core system involves you stopping disease cubes. You walk around with your characters, with your abilities, and you take actions to try to remove the spread, remove the cubes, stop the spread. Different expansions add different elements to it, and Pandemic Legacy, the first time we had that system, added the idea of things evolving. You discover characters, you unlock new new abilities, you unlock new actions, you, the, world, the, the disease starts mutating and taking things over, and you have to adapt to an ever-evolving story. And then Season 2 came over as a kind of post-apocalyptic, well, I don't want to spoil things, but a kind of post-apocalyptic sequel to the story of Season 1. And then we have Season 0, which seems to take place, I believe, like the Cold War before the first one. I don't know the exact timeline, but things will change. I am eager to dive into this one. I'm eager to see what the gameplay does and makes it different. But again, it's a core, solid system that I already enjoy, tapped off with a bit of legacy to make it that much more enjoyable. And that's basically Pandemic Legacy. I don't know where Season Zero ranks, but Pandemic Legacy as a concept is currently my 61, my number 61 out of my top 100. In any case, this video has gone on long enough and probably way too much time spent on the nature of what does and doesn't belong in a top 100, or at least my top 100. In any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. There will be more of these videos coming over the next week. And as always, have a good one.